want to start by saying thank you to Richard and Rodney and everybody for uh, allowing me to participate today. And also, um, I, I know that this was done first thing this morning, but I just wanted to say right at the end here uh, that uh, I remember Rena, and uh, she was taken from us at a very young age, about 40 years old or thereabouts. She succumbed to cancer, and uh, she was a budding and emergent urban economist, and I think that all these years later that she would uh, be just extraordinarily pleased to know that somehow we're uh, memorializing her activity and her time on this earth with our scientific inquiry. So uh, that makes me feel good that, uh, that we're remembering Rena. So anyway, um, this is a paper that a couple of you have seen, and I uh, apologize for that in advance. Uh, this paper, as Rodney said, is called The Crisis Myths Opportunities for Closure Costs and Mortgage Modification During the Great Recession. So like a couple of other papers here today, we're going back into the financial crisis for a couple of minutes here. It's co-authored with a couple of colleagues, one at the Fed, Matteo, and Chandler at Copenhagen Business School. And I guess with no further ado. So uh, firstly, no uh, review here of the financial crisis. Everybody in the room is well familiar. I will say the following, and particularly for those of you who come from outside California. 25% uh, of housing wealth nationwide resided in the state of California pre-crisis. California house prices fell during the crisis by about a third, and approximately 800,000 California homeowners went into foreclosure during this period. So the California story is salient. Now, as you know, during this period, there was uh, this avalanche of default to foreclosure and the, uh, the kind of modal policy uh, uh, reflection upon this, uh, uh, this phenomenon was effort to incent mortgage modification. And we have major efforts to incent mortgage modification at the federal level and perhaps not known to all of you in the room, uh, essentially not known to anyone, is that there was a major effort by the California state legislature as well. So you all are probably familiar with the HAMP program, Home Affordable Modification Program. This program was focused on non-conforming non loans and it basically was an effort by the federal government uh, at modification where that modification occurred loan by loan. So you're thinking about this, this magnitude of crisis that we confronted in the country and the treatment effects are loan by loan. And what's acknowledged now many, many years later is that HAMP really didn't work uh, there's a very, very good piece by Sumit Argawal and companies suggesting that HAMP failed to read it, reach its target audience, reach maybe a third of its target audience. And uh, one of the things that cited was that lenders simply did not have the infrastructure to modify loans in mass. So that's kind of what was going on at the federal level. But prior to HAMP, where we even see results in California prior to HAMP, there were a set of laws passed through the California State Legislature that we in this paper are calling the California Foreclosure Prevention Laws. And I'm gonna tell you about those laws momentarily, but in contrast to this, what I would call slender financial carrot of HAMP, this piecemeal, loan by loan, financial incentive for modification, what happened here in California, what emanated from the State Legislature was kind of like a, a big bad stick. In the sense, what the Legislature said is that it treated mortgage borrowers at the level of the lender. And it basically told the lender, uh, we're gonna impose a moratoria on your foreclosure activity unless you develop, disseminate, and make widely available mortgage modification programs. So we're gonna take this state of California, which was a non-judicial foreclosure state, and kind of turn it into a judicial foreclosure state. And this, so, there were very significant treatment effects that were absolutely immediate that were associated with the California version of mortgage modification. Again, I would guess that virtually, well, of those of you who aren't from California have never heard of our efforts in this area. I'm not aware of any popular piece that's been written on the California foreclosure prevention laws. We looked at this pretty carefully and actually it's up in Sacramento with the state legislature a while back talking about this, 
There's been no evaluation at the state level, none whatsoever. And I don't think there's any other paper other than the paper I'm going to show you today, which has actually looked at this. So the idea here is that we have a once in 100 years or so financial crisis, at least let's hope. We have a carrot, we have a stick. Kind of behooves us to take a look at these different pages in the playbook, to ask a question about the relative efficacy of one play versus the other, and maybe memorialize some of this. So that's kind of what we do here. We're going to do this through standard diff and diff. We're going to do diff and diff up the wazoo. We're going to do it at different levels of geography, from zip code to county to state. We're going to do it through something called synthetic control, which is sort of a generalized version of diff and diff. And we're going to look at a whole vector, so to speak, of housing and mortgage and durable goods spending and all sorts of other outcomes. So a word or two of institutional background, so you'll appreciate what comes next. Firstly, what I mentioned earlier, California being a non-judicial foreclosure state. It's very, very easy to foreclose, foreclose on property in this state. I mean, it's almost ridiculous. Uh, you're the lender. You put a notice of default in the mail. You wait 90 days because that's what the statute says. You put an another notice in the mail that's called a notice of sale. Ten days later, you take the property back in REO. You sell it in auction. You put the furniture on the curb. Done. That's the whole story. Whereas, um, OK, so that's kind of the status at the time of the crisis. So now we're in mid-2008. And the California uh, state legislature says, uh, we're going to do some things that are rather odd from the perspective of uh, regulation and all the rest. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to require the lender to contact the borrower and to talk to the borrower, borrower about foreclosure alternatives. And this was sort of odd. The, the, the actual legislation cites a Freddie Mac study that said uh, three-fifths of borrowers in the United States during this period had no idea that there was such a thing as an alternative to foreclosure. So OK, there's this required effort at contacting the owner. The owner then has two weeks to sort of think about this and have whatever conversation they want to have with the lender. Uh, the lender has to then wait another 30 days before the filing of a notice of default. If the lender goes on and executes a foreclosure, uh, the lender is required to maintain the property. Uh, I'll come to you in one second, Andra. Uh, this, uh, this requirement being um, rather important, it's not that, that uh, the California state, legislar st state legislature had read scientific literature on adverse externality effects associated with lack of maintenance, but nonetheless, it turns out to be significant. And unlike HAMP or HARP or anything else, the California legislation is applicable to all mortgage types, it's applicable to all owner-occupied homes, and it's applicable to anything that was originated during the boom period. So it's a uh, kind of a massive potential treatment. Andra. So foreclosure alternatives, I mean, the lender has the legal right to foreclose. And so I'm, I, like, the alternatives must be the choice of what the lender says the alternatives are. So if I'm a lender and the only alternative I give you is um, yeah. I mean, or, or pay up minus a dollar what you owe me, or I'll give you an extra 10 days. I mean, I mean what counts as an alternative? Well, I'm going to show you in a slide or two what counted as well, an acceptable. It's not a violation of the contract clause. Well, it, it may have been, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to make this comment now. I was intending to make it in a few minutes. Here's the deal. Uh, the financial institutions that originated these, law, these loans here in California were on the brink of insolvency. And we had two very major institutions that were almost too big to fail that failed here in California that were major mortgage lenders. When, when this was put down, and what happened after this was put down, you didn't hear a peep out of the lending community. You would think that if, if, you're, in, if you're taking the foreclosure option away from lenders, that, that they're going to stop lending in the state of California, or they're, they're, there's going to be a whole regime of credit rationing. 30 minutes? Seriously? Uh, I thought I only had 20 minutes total. What? No, 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 that's fine. No, so, so, so uh, this is a very interesting reaction, Andra. And what we hypothesize, although we have done no analysis on this question whatsoever, is that there was a very high level of incentive compatibility between borrower and lender here. And the last thing that IndyMac or whoever wanted in this state at the time 
was uh, just boatloads of REO. Because those boatloads of REO would just sink the institutions. They were teetering on the brink. So are you proposing, so, so what we saw that they didn't happen voluntarily in other states, are you proposing this act as a coordination mechanism for something they would not otherwise be able to? Yes, to? among other things, yes. Okay, let's keep going. So I told you about the first of the California foreclosure prevention laws and sort of what it does and who it does it for and all the rest. Second is put into place, passed by the le legislature about a year later. It's called the California Foreclosure Prevention Act. And this imposes a second 90-day moratorium on top of the first 90-day waiting period on basically uh, the filing of a notice of sale on any servicer, any lender who failed to enact comprehensive mortgage modification. So basically, lenders were told, uh, either you do modification big time, or just forget about the foreclosure option for six months on any property that you want to foreclose. So uh, now, lenders could avert the severity of this degree by getting into the modification business. Um, interestingly enough, not a lot did. But first, firstly, a couple other stipulations that relate to this. Borrow, borrower el eligibility requirements. Uh, borrowers required to live in the property, be in default, document an ability to pay the modified loan. The, the operative word there is documentation, because some of these were, loans were no doc, low doc, et cetera. So this was a bit of a change, so on and so forth. I won't go through all of it. And then an, accept, an acceptable modification program from the perspective of the state had to target a debt to gross income ratio of about 38%, plus have some write down or deferral of principal or interest or both. So this was, this was kind of big time modification. So now the paper, since we're talking about the paper, what do we do here? Well, our research questions are what we believe the policy objectives are. So this is a, a straight up exercise or an attempt at an exercise that cause and effect. It's an exercise to develop causal empirical analyses to create counterfactuals and to say relative to the counterfactual, this intervention, this treatment known as the California foreclosure prevention law laws had something to do with the incidence of default and foreclosure, had something to do with the payoff of house prices in the state of California, had based on the house price evolution, some wealth effects, some generalized spending effects, and we seek to opine as well on this taking of the foreclosure option on the part of the state of California. In other words, did this intervention adversely affect the flow of capital in the state? And beyond that, uh, was this simply a delaying tactic? Now, as far as the latter is concerned, we had powerful people in powerful places at the time. Larry Summers, head of the NEC in the first Obama White House. Uh, Tim Gaetner, of course, at Treasury. And their view of foreclosure moratoria is this is a Band-Aid. You put the Band-Aid on the wound, the wound's not going to heal. You're going to strip the Band-Aid off after six months, and the wound is going to be very ugly, and it may continue to bleed profusely or whatever. In other words, this is nothing more than a restructuring of the time frame with respect to the incidence of the larger problem. Nothing more than that. On the other hand, and I know that I've... Uh, violated every rule with respect to number of words on a slide, so what are you going to do? Uh, it just happens. But uh, some people like to read and some people like to listen, so you can do what, whichever one you want. But anyway, if you look to a, uh, the literature, you see that there are other points of view besides the points of view of Summers and Gaetner. Karen Pence had a, a paper in the Ari Stat in 2006 in which she noted the fact that judicial foreclosure states unlike California, had a more costly and lengthy foreclosure process. So that was factoid number one. Factoid number two came from Ian Sufi and Trevi, who, who noticed that in those judicial foreclosure states, foreclosure rates were lower and house prices were higher during the downturn. So that's factoid number two. So that starts to inform a bit of a different view of the p potentiality of imposing this moratoria on the wound, so to speak. And then you sort of ask the question, why? And there are various versions of, of why. One comes from Chris Girardi and company, and that talks about uh, uh, adverse maintenance externalities and foreclosure clusters. Another why comes from Elliot Annenberg and Ed Kung, 
And they talk about supply effects that relate to foreclosures, neighborhood supply effects. Otherwise come from theoretical literature that comes from Schleifer and Vishni and Krishnamurthy. This is pre-crisis where they talk about fire sales. And the idea is you sort of think about foreclosures as fire sales. If you can interrupt the flow of fodder into the fire sale, you can change the price dynamic. And that's part of the potential why as well. And then there's this issue of um, the Gaetner argument that any propensity to consume out of modification related increments to housing wealth would basically be nada, basically be none of the above, it'd basically be immaterial. That was the point of view. Now, um, people in this room have looked at this question. I'm looking at two of them. One's Gary Painter and the other is Shalali. And people have different estimates of these propensities to consume out of housing wealth. Uh, Shalali's was a little lower than uh, the work that Gary and I and Raphael did. And incidentally, there's a paper in the AER just now, I just saw it yesterday, that re-estimates this whole thing. And the estimate that, that is published is, is incidentally closer to the one that, that Gary and I and Raphael came up with. But regardless, Gaetner was saying, you know, basically households would either be unwilling or unable uh, to consume based on some moderation in the decline in the value of this depreciated, illiquid, hard to value housing assets. So, so Gaetner was from there, but yet there's potentiality along those lines. So let me, let me tell you what we know, uh, absent our analysis, and then I'm gonna go into this effort to concoct a counterfactual in eight different ways, convince you that I have the right counterfactual and that I can draw a causal influence with respect to the, the estimates that we have. So this is what we know, and it's kind of a sad story, and maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, it's late in the afternoon, but I think what we know is just three or four points on one slide. And what we know is that A, permanent mortgage modifications in California in the immediate aftermath of the crisis were large relative to foreclosures. Now, neither number is huge, but the modification number is larger, suggestive that there may be some algorithm pushing in the direction of modification. The second point we know is that the vast majority of those modifications didn't occur via HAMP. And that second factoid is consistent with the idea that HAMP didn't reach its target audience. The third thing we know is that a lot of lenders in the state uh, did not enact modification programs. In other words, were subject to this additional 90-day moratoria on foreclosure. And this is where we come up with this point here that relates to incentive compatibility. And the idea that, in fact, you know, none of the lenders are fighting this moratorium, and there may be a reason for that. This is all um, secondary. Uh, this is coming from the state of California. It's coming just from kind of secondary sources. Should we uh, amortize missed payments if we recapitalize it into missed payments? Is that counting as a permanent? That's way too hard a question for this time on Friday afternoon. Uh, I, I, I actually have no idea. You know, because I, in order to answer that question properly, I would have to really know the data that was utilized to do this. It's probably buried in a footnote, but I, I'm sorry. I just don't know. Um, okay. So anyway, that's what we know. What we know, just to summarize, is that there appears to be some algorithm putting us into uh, modification. This is your standard what, what we did in the slide and what we found. And let me just summarize it because it's late and you don't need all the gory detail. But we're gonna look at a variety of outcome terms. I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of those outcome terms momentarily. The outcome terms relate to the incidence of foreclosure, to uh, default and delinquency, to housing returns, to modification rates, to propensities to consume out of housing wealth. And we're looking at uh, consumption of durable goods as measured by auto sales. We're looking at prolongation of the crisis, delay of foreclosure to a, 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 a time frame beyond the treatment period. In other words, we're gonna to look to see whether the uh, results are present beyond the treatment period. And finally, we're gonna look at the Gaetner and Summers hypothesis that you strip the Band-Aid off and the wound continues to ooze. In other words, that all we've done is uh, uh, delay these effects. And basically, our answers here are all supportive of the California intervention. They're not 
one here, yes, one here, no. We, we results all line up in the same direction. And they say that there were salutary effects of this intervention, of this stick. Now, in order to make that statement, you're going to have to concur that we have a plausible counterfactual and can make those kind of statements. But, you know, what else is new? OK, so uh, the 30,000 foot view of the paper is that the stick was mightier than the carrot. The California Preve foreclosure prevention law effect was mightier than hemp. And again, with respect to the summer's concerns, we show results that are long lived. We don't show reversion, upward reversion in default or foreclosure as soon as the treatment period ceases. Okay, so now, given that it's uh, 520 on Friday afternoon, I'm going to focus your attention on things you can't see. And uh, I, I apologize for that, but you don't really have to see a lot here. And actually, there's no analysis whatsoever on this slide. Here's, here's what's going on here. This, is, this slide is nothing more than a motivational factoid. And let me, let me give you the factoid. So firstly, we're looking at a bunch of outcome terms. And these outcome terms are going to persist throughout the entirety of the story. So we have foreclosure starts that comes from the mortgage bankers. That's closer to the notice of default. We have Zillow REO foreclosures. That's closer to the notice of sale. That comes from Zillow. We have disaggregation of foreclosure starts between prime and subprime. We have something called the MDRI, the Mortgage Default Risk Index, which was this crazy concoction that, that Chandler and I got to by creating a Mortgage Default Risk Index via Google search query data. And if you want to take a look at that, um, I can give you the citation on that. We have house price returns that comes from FIFA, that comes from Zillow, bottom tier, top tier, et cetera. So those are outcome terms. And those are outcome terms we're going to play through in all the diff and diff and in the synthetic control. But we haven't done any of that yet. The only thing we've got here is we're plotting those outcome terms from 2004, way pre-crisis, all the way through 2015. The crisis, the treatment period, is the red line through the purple line. The red line is the immediate implementation of SB 1137, or whatever it was, the first of the California foreclosure prevention laws. The, the uh, purple line here is the end of treatment. So we have pre-treatment, treatment, post-treatment. Post -treatment. California is a heavy black line. The other blue stuff is one version of a counterfactual, the other sand states. And if you look to just simply the plots here, you see that in terms of foreclosure starts, in terms of MDRI, take the MDRI, for example. Here's California. It looks like pretty much right around the treatment. California breaks off from the other uh, sand states. Mortgage default risk declines in California. Foreclosure starts decline in California. Uh, Zillow REO, REO foreclosures decline in California, again, relative to our, our counterfactual. And again, there's no analysis here. I'm just giving you the, the appetizer, which uh, uh, is also at the back of the room. But, but this is another version of an appetizer. Yes? Are these uh, comparable appetizer state states also non-judicial? Oh, two out of the three are. Beautiful question. Uh, the question are, are we comparing apples to apples? In other words, are these all non-judicial states? Or Florida is a judicial foreclo foreclosure state. Arizona and Nevada are not. So in a way, we could be diluting the results by including Florida here. In other words, the results could be even bigger if we just confine our counterfactual to non-judicial foreclosure states. But anyway, what we see here is we see a hint that something happening in California uh, during the treatment period. OK. So, so here now, uh, we're going to do the same thing. And again, this doesn't really count, on, count as science either, this particular chart, because it, it, or if it was science, it would be very poor science. But we have all the outcome terms here on the left-hand side. We've got the treatment period up here. We've got the outcomes during the treatment period for California relative to these other sand states, where we're pretending that the other sand states are the counterfactual. And we're going to look in column five here at the outcome for California relative to the average of the other sand states. So if you want, you could call this an aggregate diff and diff. And if you don't want to call it that, you can just call it what I just described it as. But regardless, take a look here. So in terms of foreclosure starts, they went up by about 16% during the treatment period in California. 
And that was about 8.6 percentage points less than the average of the three other sand states. Or down here, FIFA, house price growth. House prices in California due to the treatment period declined by 20%. And that was about 13% less than roughly speaking the 33% decline in house prices in the other sand states. So again, aggregate diff and diff, you guys, you know, uh, doesn't, does that count for anything, Matt? Yes. It's okay, it's suggestive, right? Is that a good word? Yes. Okay, suggestive. No, no more than suggestive. Okay, now we're starting to crank up a little bit because we have a few degrees of freedom. We have a little bit of power. So now some of our outcome terms, very few, but some are available at lower levels of geography. And the lower levels of geography give us a little bit of, uh, give us a few observations, give us some degrees of freedom, and allow us to run a diff and diff the way we're supposed to run the diff and diff, especially when we get to the zip code level. So now this Zillow All Homes house price growth, we can run for all zip codes in these four states, do the proper diff and diff with the controls here in the memo item to the table. And here we see that in California, in this zip code level analysis, house prices fall by 25% during the uh, treatment period. And that's about 8.5% less than the decline in uh, zip codes in the other sand states. So just here, um, FIFA house price growth, it was 13 here, and here it's eight, eight and a half, here it's seven. I think I did that right. No, no, Zillow, sorry, Zillow. Zillow, so it's 14% uh, in the aggregate diff and diff, and it's 8% and 7%, so different, uh, slightly different versions of the answer based on, and of course these are much more qualified. Okay, so you have the diff and diff analysis. Now, let's talk about that for a little bit. I may not have convinced anybody of anything in the sense that you could say to me, you know, Stuart, the, you, you chose the counterfactual in the diff and diff. And you chose as a counterfactual the other sand states. Now it's true that during the crisis there were four sand states, and it's true that they all had sand, and it's true that uh, they all had high housing supply elasticities, and it's true that they all had high incidence of subprime lending, and it's true that they had a big default and foreclosure cycle and a big house price cycle. So plausibly, to use the other three sand states as a counterfactual for California, well, Matt, what do you say? Is that okay or not so good? Or? Keep going. But, but here, here's what Matt would say. He would say that the choice of the counterfactual is endogenous to the researcher, and that's not 100% cool. And so he would say, I want to see some robustness to various counterfactuals. Won't you say that? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you awake? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so, uh, so here's another version of how to concoct a counterfactual. And it's a method that's been popular, popularized by a guy named Abadi, who as far as I know is in the econ department at MIT. And he could put a couple of papers into journals, one, one into JASA and I think the other into the AER, that sort of popularized this methodology. And what this, met, this methodology isn't good for all diff and diff, but it's good, it kind of generalizes diff and diff when you're working with panel data that's of moderate size. So you're not going to do this with huge numbers of individual level observations, but you're going to do this with panel. And the whole idea of the synthetic control is let's take what we're up to. So we have an intervention, a treatment that occurs in California at time X. But we have 49 other states where there's no intervention. Why not use the information from the 49 other states to create a synthetic California and I'm going to tell you how we do that momentarily. That's exogenous to me as a researcher. I'm not choosing the counterfactual. It's now brought to me via a numeric, coming, 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 com brought to me via a numeric algorithm. And uh, I'm going to show you pictures of why I think that particular counterfactual is a good counterfactual. And then based on that, we go on our way. And what Abadi says in his papers, of course, is that now that we have created this 
exogenously and numerically defined counterfactual, we can now ascribe causality to the difference between the treated term and the counterfactual during the treatment period. So I, I am going to do what no economist uh, does except with a lot of uh, trepidation. I'm going to use the causal word, okay, so uh, here and there. So, okay, so we're going to do synthetic control. And we can do synthetic control on panels of states, on panels of counties, and on panels of zip codes. We can do that all, and we do do that all. And the way that synthetic control works is I'm going to take this panel of non-treated zip codes, or this panel of counties that aren't treated, or this panel of states that aren't treated, and I'm going to take, I'm going to weight outcome terms in that panel, or, or covariates of output, out, outcome terms in those panels, so as to approximate the path of the outcome term to be treated pre-treatment. Now, don't ask me to repeat any of that. I know that it was all put into one sentence and whatever, but okay, so let me, instead of saying that again, let me show you. Those are some weights. So, so here's the deal. This is kind of a, a central exhibit, uh, similarly designed so you can't see it or you can't even focus on it at this time of the day. But here again, this is like the first slide that I showed you, except now we're doing causal economics. I'm not just showing you lines of outcome terms. So what's happening here? Same outcome terms. The black is the same line. It's California. California is the treated outcome during the treatment period, the same treatment period between the red and the purple. Post-treatment is to the right of the purple. The blue now is the synthetic control. And bear in mind that the numeric algorithm that we're working off of in the synthetic control is that this panel of untreated uh, elements is used to concoct a control that mimics the path of the outcome unit to be treated pre-treatment. Said differently, the blue line, which is the synthetic control for each of these outcome terms, and the black line have to be on top of each other. If this minimization, this distance minimization algorithm is working the way it's supposed to, and it can never be perfect, but it can be pretty close, and it is pretty close. So take your outcome term, whichever one you want, you see that the black, black, the treated California, this is pre-treatment, and the blue, pre-treatment synthetic control, are more or less on top of each other. That forms the basis of our assertion in a body's assertion that now the blue is going to be a good approximation for the counterfactual of California untreated during the treatment period. The black is California treated during the treatment period so that the vertical distance between the blue and the black summed over the treatment period is a measure of the treatment effect. Now we can look at this. Or, and when you look at it, you see, yes, there's a pretty big vertical distance between the blue and the black on foreclosure starts, certainly on mortgage default risk, et cetera. It looks like there's a treatment effect. And it looks like it's material. OK, don't everybody shake your heads at once. So, so again, I, I'm working really hard to try to see if anyone's still awake. But um, it's very hard. You guys are not an easy audience. Um, my MBA students are like easier than you all. Anyway, here are the outcome terms. Here's California during the treatment period. Here's the synthetic control during the treatment period. And here's the gap. And now we can compare that gap, for example, to a gap with the usual diff and diff. And the gaps are of similar orders of magnitude. So again, FIFA house price growth. House prices fell in California during the treatment period by 20%. The synthetic control said without the intervention, they would have fallen by 40%. So the intervention moderated that decline in California house prices. I, I, I don't want to cut you off. No, I, I, I of course, will take your question. But there, there is a quota system. You, you realize that, right? <laughs> so uh, you're, 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 you're close, but go, please. Okay, last question. Um, I mean, the, the, the argument usually for avoiding these sorts of programs or certainly not making them mandatory, aside from it being in violation of the contract clause, is that 
you're forcing, there's a bunch of people who wouldn't let their house go to foreclosure, and you're taking losses on those mortgages that would stay perfectly healthy. So to me, the right metric is not did you prevent foreclosures, it's what happened to bank balance sheets. Did this actually improve bank balance sheets? That, to me, is sort of the, the key question that we were concerned about. And okay, well, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of stuff at the end. Whole bunch. But that's not one of the things I'm going to show you. And I, I like that. That's why we present papers, is to get ideas like that. So that's a nice idea. I like that. But uh, OK, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that further. OK, so getting back, California synthetic control gap. This is the magnet. This column here, column four, is the causally ascribed magnitude of the treatment effect. Rodney. Stuart, so I, I guess I, I haven't used up my quota yet. So how do the ah. numbers compare to the Mian, Sufi, and Trevi papers and to the Karen Pence paper in 06? Okay. They do a little bit of that, I think, on house prices Let between the judicial and power of sales states. I don't have an exact answer for you on that, but I have some analyses that are going to come where I show you durable goods spending and auto spending, and we use the same metric and the same data as Mian, Sufi, et cetera, in using this Polk data on automobile sales, et cetera. And there, I, I can show you some. Yes, Richard. So, when we, so I was just looking at employment data in Nevada and California. You have a lot of loading on Nevada in this. So both states lost jobs at very similar rates before 2010. But then California really turned around in 2010, and Nevada didn't in 2012. And so couldn't this just be that Nevada happened to have uh, longer? And or do you think that the foreclosure law led to California recovering jobs? So you know, here, here's what I was, Richard, I'm not going to answer the substantive question about employment, because I really don't know the answer to that question. But I'm going to answer a different question, or at least address a different question, which is the following. The creation of counterfactuals in scientific research, be it medicine or economics or whatever it is, is entirely difficult. And uh, what we're doing here is, at least in terms of synthetic control, is we're, we're playing the following game. We're, we're, we're suggesting to ourselves that if we can create a synthetic version of California that mimics California during the pretreatment period, then we should be able to infer that the difference between that synthetic version of California and the actual California during the treatment period would provide some revelation of treatment effect. Now, what you're saying, basically, in two words or less, if I understand you correctly, is that we have a relationship that pervaded here between... Right. right. You, what you're saying, in a loose translation, is that we have a set of relationships here that are embodied in part in the weights that Nate were talking about. And you're saying that relationship changed yeah. during the treatment period. Yeah. Yeah. That's a completely plausible statement. There's no, but what do we do as social scientists to create counterfactuals? As I said, we're trying to throw the book at this. We're doing all the different diff, we're doing it at different levels, with different specifications, with different controls, and different outcome terms, and we're doing the synthetic control. This is what I know how to do. This is what we collectively know how to do. So, so one, one quick follow-up on that, and I'm, I'm trying to think of ways, because I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit with Richard on this one, but I'm, I'm trying to think of ways on, on how to uh, maybe tackle part of this problem. I'm not going to offer you a big solution uh, on this, but are those weights stable pre-treatment? Pre are those, so those 49 states that you have in your pre-treated in synthetic control, is, does Nevada always have a 18% weight or whatever? You get one weight per place per pre-treatment pre period, but the weights vary by outcome terms. And the weights vary across levels of geography. But so the weights are always recomputed. So you could, if you would get an idea of the distribution of those weights from pre-treatment period to pre-treatment period, you could get an idea of the magnitude of those weight changes in year over year pre-treatment in terms of magnitude maybe, of that. Maybe, maybe, maybe we better. did a little bit of that. But again, these are exogenously defined treatment periods, okay? 
you know, this treatment occurred at date X when SB 1137 went into effect. No, I get that, but what I'm trying to say is when, when you see in your, in your synthetic control that the weight of Nevada changes for that particular outcome term, almost doubles from 2004 to 2005 in order to follow California, then, <laughs> then reach its point of that weight being stable. Yeah, okay, so I, I totally get what you're saying. Now I could do some robustness yeah. with this in terms of moving around the vertical line a little bit. And I can do that. I think we already did some of that. Okay. And it, it doesn't, um, if that would satisfy Richard, we could well, do that. What, what, what Are you the referee on this paper? I am curious <laughs> what would satisfy me. If you did um, the Inland Empire yes. versus the, and weighted it. Yes. Because when I think about see, San Francisco, I just don't buy that you can like synthetically okay. replicate San Francisco. Whereas the Inland Empire in Nevada and Arizona make great comps for each other. And if you sort of look at how long it took the Inland Empire to recover, it's a very okay, different so, story. So than I'm going to show you uh, the, the within California geographic incidence of this analysis uh, by sort of coding the county level results. And I can do that with a zip code level results. So I'm going to show that to you momentarily. So yes, if, if I understand what you're asking for, I have a slide that does that momentarily. So I showed you this, I showed you that. This is again, same story. Now at the zip code level, at the county level, uh, we're getting roughly similar results. We show the gap weighted mean across, and again, I'm not picking these series. These are simply the only series available to me that at that level of geography. I'm using whatever data is available. So Richard, here you go. So now we're going to got different outcome terms. So we start with the Zillow REO foreclosures, then we go to house price growth, and then we go to the Zillow top and bottom tier house price growth. And this is the geographic, the intra-California geographic incidence of the treatment, where this is all synthetic control driven. And again, the weights here are weights that are comprised at the county level. We're, we're looking, f we're creating the counterfactual out of counties throughout the US, okay, that kind of thing. And here, for example, and it tells a story that you would anticipate, and the story is that uh, this, uh, this treatment disproportionately benefited LA County. It benefited surrounding counties of the Southern California coast, the Inland Empire. These were big deal areas for foreclosure, Kern County, Bakersfield, Tulare County, up and down the Central Valley, Fresno, et cetera. Okay, so anyway, Richard, you have the county level effects, right? And you, you have some more of that here. And you have that for the bottom tier and the top tier. And, uh, and you see, you, you see the relative incidence of the intervention. Let me, I, I, I realize I've been terribly long-winded and I want to do a few other things, so let me, let me just, can I, can I say four or five things really quickly? And then, uh, bef um, okay. So uh, there was, I believe, an issue correctly brought forward about whether the counterfactual was comprised, whether the synthetic control counterfactual was comprised of the full panel of information available to us or only judicial foreclosure or non-judicial foreclo foreclosure states, recognizing that we could sort of bias results against us by including judicial foreclosure states in the set of information that would be utilized to comprise the synthetic control. So here we do the whole thing over again using only non-judicial foreclosure states to comprise the counterfactual because California's a non-judicial foreclosure state. And here you see that the results or even more pronounced with respect to the Zillow All Homes house price growth, just as you would anticipate. So that's one thing. Now I'm just gonna run through a set of questions that are indicated at the top part of the slide and just try to answer those questions real quickly. So the first question is the uh, Summers story of this sort of hypothesis that the effects would be transitory. In other words, you rip off the Band-Aid, the wound continues to bleed. So here, there's a, we're, we're going to do synthetic control here on seriously delinquent loans where we have California, the black, the counter 
factual of California, the blue, and also foreclosure inventory, California, the black, counter, uh, counter, uh, counterfactual in the blue. And here, we're not really interested in anything except what's to the right of the purple line. In other words, post-treatment, do the effects persist? And what we see here, absolutely, you would think that if this was a Band-Aid and the wound was going to bleed hard as soon as the Band-Aid's pulled off, you would expect the black line to move up and even cross the blue line. And we see none of that. We see the two remain equidistant from one another, plus or minus, blah, blah, blah. And so our answer was the effect transitory associated with the treatment. Our answer to that question is no, it wasn't. Next question. Did the California foreclosure prevention laws increase mortgage modifications? So now we're going to run a probate on modification conditional on delinquency. We're going to run this using Fannie Mae loan performance data. Take a look at equation number four here. This is the equation with a full set of loan level house price macro controls, very large number of observations. And these observations are pulled from three non-judicial foreclosure states. And you see here that the interactive term of California during the period of the California foreclosure prevention laws comes with a positive and significant coefficients. Uh, I, I know I'm running along and saying a lot quickly here, but the idea is, did the California foreclosure prevention laws increase mortgage modifications? Our direct reflection on that question is yes. Yes, they did. Next question, Andra's early question, did the California foreclosure prevention laws, foreclosure taking, the taking of the foreclosure option from the lender result in credit rationing. Well, now we're going to use Humda data. We're going to use Humda data at the loan level and at the zip code level. We're going to look at different counterfactuals, the usual counterfactual, and a completely different sample that includes California, Colorado, New York, Texas. We're going to look at probits on probability of denial. We're going to look at loan growth in dollar and in number value. We see no evidence here whatsoever of credit rationing as a consequence of the intervention. What about uh, durable goods spending as a consequence of uh, the increment in house values associated with the California foreclosure prevention laws? We're going to regress the synthetic control gap in auto sales growth in California. We do this at the county level on the synthetic control gap in California house price growth. And that we believe that's all exogenous on the right hand side. And we see a salutary effect there. And I can, I can tell I'm completely out of time here. We're going to estimate propensities to consume. And you can see here that these are virtually all statistically significant. And Gary, they're in the uh, range of our prior estimates. So whatever. OK. So and does do the California foreclosure prevention laws affect refinancing volume? And the answer is uh, there's no adverse effect on refinancing volume. So we, we try to answer that question as well. So basically, I'm done. The only thing I want to say is that we also did sort of a back of the envelope. What if this regime had been imposed on Arizona and Nevada? And the answer is about 100,000 homes would have been safe from foreclosure with an increment in housing wealth of about 400 billion. Thank you very much. What are the effect of these policies? There are a lot of government policies aimed at stabilizing the housing market. Uh, if we think about QE by the Fed, buying mortgage-backed securities. But if we think about HAMP, the paper points out, HAMP didn't have really wide adoption. California took this much more aggressive program. So it's useful to think about the effect of this. What's its effect for the broader economy, the macro economy? How did this work as a policy? Um, and the approach is basically comparing the outcomes in California at different levels versus controls. Whether those are synthetic controls or diff and diff is the main thing. And they look at quite a few things, foreclosures, housing price growth, mortgage modifications, uh, a number of other potential effects, such as loan denial, loan volume. Uh, and they also look at these heterogeneous effects that I'll talk about more. Um, as a summary of the results, uh, they estimate what this does. So this decreased foreclosures, increased house prices and mortgage modifications. And these aggregate effects are big. That's a, that's a key thing that's stressed here. It increased California housing wealth by around 300 billion and led to more than 100,000 fewer foreclosures. And they say that's the more conservative result. Um, and 
they look at some other things. It doesn't seem like afterwards this led to less lending in California. Um, the heterogeneity lines up with some intuition, and there is this increase in auto sales that lines up with the geographical dispersion and effects. So that's the summary. I'm talking a little bit fast. I want to, one, get to my comments, and two, let you guys get out of here. Uh, so there's two main sets of comments. Uh, first, on identification, as people pointed out, the main source of identification is relative to a control, California seemed to be different. Um, so this brings up the idea, is this the only reason why California was different in this time period? I'm going to have a few thoughts about that and suggest looking at more in within state variation. The second is to think more about general equilibrium effects. Uh, this whole effect works through spillovers or GE effects. So if we think about housing prices and the desired outcomes, it will directly stop foreclosures by raising the cost. But the whole reason why house prices should rise, according to the literature this cites, is if there's fewer foreclosures, there'll be fewer houses on the market, so the supply of houses being sold are less, or there's this disamenity effect. If a house is on foreclosure, it, uh, it's not kept up, and that reduces prices. So the nature of these spillovers are going to be really important. So if we're going to think about this as a policy, if the next housing crisis happens in 50 years, should this be a federal program, these are going to be very important things. So let me first talk about identification. Um, so let me first direct your eyes to the plot. Um, so this is California, Nevada, and Arizona, FHFA. This is levels, not returns, uh, normalized to be 100 in 2008. You see that California and Nevada, which are the blue and red lines, are very similar. For quite a, few, for quite a time period, they begin to diverge during the treatment period, and then they basically stay about equally apart. There seems to be no catch up. The effect seems to be permanent. So this is something that is presented as desirable in your paper. As a macroeconomist, this puzzles me. I'm thinking about a depressed market in 2007 to 2009. But if the housing market is recovered by now, I would have expected that Nevada would have kept up a little bit. Uh, the fact that that doesn't happen <coughs> raises some concerns here about what's going on. So uh, you know, I, I don't have a, an alternative explanation that explains it, but one thought that I do have in my head is uh, it may be hard to tell what's a bubble. So in my neighborhood, Culver City, house prices have gone up a lot. 2007 prices don't seem that crazy given today. Vegas is very different. Um, so this may be they look the same because people can't tell apart some other shock that's realized. So this is a potential concern for identification that other people have pointed out, uh, though I'm not, I, I'm not sure exactly what the explanation would be. There is a way to address this uh, that others pointed out, and that you do do some in the paper, which is look more within states. Uh, so the idea basically here is the the, the literature that, that you cite, these uh, spillovers coming from the supply of housing or disamenity, should be greater with places with more foreclosure risk. If you live in a neighborhood where there's no foreclosure or very little foreclosure risk, this should do nothing. The, the, it's not going to make the supply of housing being sold less. There won't be disamenity effects. There should be very small effect of this policy relative to the, you know, some place like the Inland Empire, where there may be high foreclosure risk. Therefore, you have a big effect. So I think the data work you have suggests that these trends seem to be there. But if you can come up with a formal test of this that gives numbers, that would be a lot more convincing. And it would be much, it's much easier to, to come up with a reason why California was different than Nevada during this time period than it is to tell me why, why, was, why were these, why, why were outcomes heterogeneously different in California than Nevada during this time period? Um, so that, uh, so some sort of estimation like that would help get to identification. And I'm going to also say that'll be informative about some other things combined with your current estimate. Um, 
So the second point I want to make is as a macroeconomist, uh, I'm going to think that this is the, I'm going to think about this as a policy. And if I'm going to think about this as a policy, uh, I'm going to look at your macro estimates and maybe think uh, what, what assumptions are being made here. And the correct answer is it's assuming that a certain type of general equilibrium effects. You're assuming that all of these effects are local or within your unit of observation, within California, or if, or if you're doing this, uh, if you're looking, if you're constructing estimates from within California, within that area. Uh, but there are a number of other GE effects that could raise or lower macro effects, uh, such as uh, what uh, Andra pointed out through the lending side, for example. Um, so there's a bunch of other ones to think about. So for example, how segmented are housing markets? So when you get heterogeneous estimates, you're, this, is, this is implicitly speaking to that. Are these, uh, when you have lower, lower floor closures in a zip code, does that affect neighboring zip codes? Uh, and so on. Uh, the lender side is really interesting too. There may be this direct harm to lenders. At the same time, the fact that prices rise, there may be this benefit. And uh, I actually did some uh, investigating to see what were mortgage lenders lobbying for. So there were quite a few proposed legislations that put more costs of foreclosures that they opposed. They were not lobbying against the first bill, SB 1137. They actually worked, did some negotiations to have it written a certain way. Um, uh, there's some interesting things there. Also, uh, there are interesting questions around a Lucas critique or moral hazard problem. If this becomes the policy, will people take lots of risk? Your, your results a little bit indicate no. L at least lending seemed to not fall afterwards. Uh, so perhaps at least lenders aren't reacting uh, in line with what you would expect if people would be trying to take crazy risk. Um, I know that this is a reduced form uh, empirical paper, so you're not going to do all of what one would do with a full structural model. But to the ex you, this data you have may be useful in constructing moments that shed light on this. And then if someone wants to tackle it with a structural model, they can do this. So a key thing I would say, if you estimate heterogeneous effects, versus your aggregate California effect, that's going to be indicative of local spillovers versus statewide spillovers. Um, and also, if you can get data on lending relationships, so if you could see banks that have exposure to California but lend in nearby states, there may be some interesting things you could see there as well. Uh, ultimately, this is a, to conclude, this is a nice paper. I learned a lot. It also raised some very interesting questions for future work outside the scope of this paper. A key one that, I'm, that it raises to me is what's the optimal cost of foreclosure? So first in levels, is it too low during normal times? If your effect is permanent, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe the, it's too low. Also, the paper seems to suggest it may be counter-cyclical. So what's the optimal policy? Thank you very much.